Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final week of the Advanced Topics course. Um, thank you all for adjusting to the lecture schedule as, as the course went on. Um, I know I was originally supposed to do clocks in April, but it turned out to be more convenient for my module to be at the end. Um, right, and compared to last year and compared to the lecture notes that you will see online, um, this year I will be doing really the, the first part of clocks, which is what clocks are and how you see that they, they are used to describe unitary operations in a, in a self-consistent manner, which I will explain what that is. Um, what I will not be going into in much detail is the information theory of clocks, although there will be one tutorial question today that will deal with this a little bit, and depending on how uh, this lecture goes, Perhaps tomorrow, towards the end of tomorrow's final lecture, I will talk a little bit about that. Um, okay, so clocks. So what is the motivation for studying clocks in general or timekeeping devices in general, and particularly from the perspective of quantum theory? There are two general motivations. The first one, of course, is fundamental. Um, how do we as, as human beings experience the flow of time what is time? Is time an, you know, an ob observable that we can measure? Is time just a parameter that we see by measuring other things? Um, is time something fundamental that exists in the universe, or is it actually something that is emergent? So some, um, ever since the advance of quantum theory, where position and momentum were given observable status and time was not, there have been many sort of directions in which this understanding of the role of time has gone. Um, and one of which, for example, is that time, in fact, does not um, exist as a fundamental thing that, or, or, or with respect to which the universe is changing, but rather we, the way we exist in the universe and um, experience the flow of time simply by changes in our state. Um, so the examples of this would be the block universe, where you just consider all of space-time, where time and space are just both coordinates there. And the only experience of time is because you have a world line of a particular system that is, that is, you see each point as a different point in time. Another version in quantum theory is the page Wouters theory, um, way of looking at, at time. And um, I will not go that, into that into detail. All, all it seeks to do is to say that, in fact, you can describe the entirety of, of time by a single state, where you have your, your state at different times correlated with another variable which itself is acting like a clock. And then the only reason you see time is because you actually have correlations between your state and that variable, which you call time. But in fact, the whole state exists um, as, a, as an entity w without changing. You only change because you're inside of that. Anyway, these are all fundamental questions about time. The other motivation is actually quite operational, very resource theoretic. We've been talking a lot about um, different manners in which we manipulate systems throughout this course. So we started with quantum thermodynamics, which was all about the manipulation of systems, about temperature, about engines, about machines. Then Lydia did, did resource theories, both in general and more specific to the quantum scenario. And then you had a little bit of learning theory, uh, where you considered the um, tomography, which is making measurements on a system to learn about the system. Now, in every one of them, you have something at the center of all of them is the unitary operation. Because we, we understand now that whenever a quantum system changes, the correct way to describe it is via unitary operation. Even in the case when we consider, oh, I make a CPTP map, which is more general than a unitary operation on a system, we still say, well, a CPTP map can always be diluted. We can always understand it as a unitary operation acting on a larger thing, the system plus a large enough environment. So we understand that the unitary operation is fundamental. And so we had all of these resources that we looked at when we did resource theories. We have the unitary operation acting on our system and something else, that something else could be a thermal bath, or it could be I don't have a thermal bath, but my unitary is allowed to give energy to the system, etc. But now I want to look at the unitary itself, because a unitary operation does not just happen. In order for a unitary operation to, be, to occur on a system, you must have some Hamiltonian acting on that system for, for a certain amount of time. Because the other thing that we know from... Uh, quantum theory is that the correct way to describe the evolution of any system is by saying that 
it satisfies the Schrodinger equation. So I have I h bar divided by dot of psi is equal to h psi. So the only way a unitary operation is going to happen is if I choose a particular Hamiltonian that is going to make this unitary operation happen after that Hamiltonian acts for a certain time t. But already here I see now that there is another resource that I haven't considered, which is the resource of timing. Because the thing about the unitary operation is, if I, if I write a unitary operation as e to the minus i h int times t for a particular h int and for a particular t, then if I change t, I'm not going to get the same unitary. It is, it is the product of these two that gives me my unitary. If I change one of them, I won't get the correct unitary. And so t is also important. What that means is that I need something to be able to turn on this Hamiltonian and then turn off this Hamiltonian in such a way that the amount of time that the Hamiltonian has acted is exactly the amount of time that I required for the unitary operation. So this becomes another resource. It's not at the same level of the other ones like thermal baths or states or energy batteries, for instance. But it is a resource. It's a hidden one in the construction of this unitary operation itself. OK, so one example that I will sort of return to a number of times in, uh, during this lecture is imagine that I have just a spin half particle. So let me take the example to be a spin half particle that starts in the state, um, let's call it plus. OK, and, and I have this spin half particle and I want it to change to the state minus. And I'm going to take the particle to have no Hamiltonian in the beginning. So it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a state that does not change in time because it has no Hamiltonian. And I want to change it to minus. How can I do this? Well, an easy way to do this would be to take h int, for example, is equal to sigma z. Because plus and minus are the eigenstates of x. So all that I need to rotate an eigenstate of x is to make a Hamiltonian in Either y or z, it does not matter. Z would work just as well. So how would I do this? One easy way of doing this in the laboratory would be the following. I take this spin half particle, and I stick it on top of something, and I send that thing through a magnetic field. So my spin half particle s sits on top of something, and that thing just travels. And as it travels, it goes through a region with a magnetic field that magnetic field being B is equal to some constant times sigma z. So let's, uh, well, B is equal to A times sigma z, the Pauli spin operator. Okay. And so now I know, well, if this happens, plus will start to rotate in the z basis. Eventually, it will get to minus, so I have to choose basically the endpoints of this, so I call this x1 and x2, and the velocity v in such a way that what I'm going to get in this picture now, if, if my particle moves at a constant velocity through this magnetic field, then the time it's in this magnetic field is t is equal to x2 minus x1 upon v. And then I have, of course, h int is equal to a times sigma z. And so I get that u, the unitary operation that happens as a result, is e to the minus i a x2 minus x1 upon v times sigma z. And so I have to choose this to be pi over 2, because we know that plus goes to minus with a pi over 2 rotation in, around any axis. OK, so this, what I've just done here, is actually an example of how to include a clock into my description. Because what you've noticed here is that in the original description of the unitary, I had t explicitly. I just had that, oh, some, something has to happen at particular times. But by going to this description where I have a particle that's moving along a line, going through a magnetic field, t is now actually not a fundamental variable. It's actually not t. It's x2 minus x1 upon v. So my unitary now is actually not, it's not dealt with by explicit time. It's not like somebody came along. Turned, in an interaction, turned on an interaction Hamilton and turned it off. Rather, the natural motion of the particle itself did this for us. So this particle here that moves is, in fact, a clock. And it's exactly the type of system that we would want to consider. It's a system that takes away the need for an explicit time control by dealing with time via 
its own degree of freedom. So in this case here, the particle is a clock because it has a degree of freedom, that is x, which changes very regularly. So it's guaranteed to just be moving regularly around x, which means that now we can time things by simply timing them with respect to x rather than with respect to some t that is external. And so this essentially is what a clock is. a system with uh, so let's say a degree of freedom that evolves regularly with time. And this time is Schrodinger time, the time that's in Schrodinger equation. Now, actually, what I've done is I've written the definition of a good clock, because in fact, anything that changes in time is in some sense a clock. You can, you can observe the passage of time from it. But most systems will allow you to do this either very badly in terms of precision or just for a short time. So if I, if I toss something in the air as it's going up and down, it is a clock, but it's pretty much useless for most things I want it to, to do. So that's, that's a clock. And the other thing which is important, which is something that I didn't take here because I took it to be very ideal, is one where the interaction with the environment or agent, this could be an experimental person, um, does not affect it. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that the clock must be something where when we interact with it to use it to gain time information from it or to use it to time processes, that should not have a negative impact on the clock. And this is something that is important quantum mechanically because we, we somehow have this intuition that whenever we write anything quantum mechanically, we know that measurements, for example, disturb quantum states. We know that when we have non-commuting Hamiltonians, things don't work out ideally. So this is something that we will see during the lecture. Um, but we're going to start with an ideal case and then take it to be slightly less, uh, um, less good in some sense. All right. Any questions so far? No? OK. Yes? Indeed, we cannot. And so this is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to start by taking now, the next thing I'm going to do is to take the ideal Hamiltonian of a clock, which would guarantee that, but it's unphysical. And then the next thing, the step after that was to is to consider how these ideal Hamiltonians are approximations to real ones, and then what are the problems we face in the real ones. So indeed, yeah? And the definition, what, what does regularly mean? So regularly means, it's, so one thing is it's, it's predictable, and it has... Um, so the easiest example of regularity is where something will happen every one second or every def definite unit of time. So then you know, so a, a pendulum, for example, a well-functioning pendulum, every time you hear it tick, for instance, if it's a pendulum clock, you know that that tick has happened every particular time period. So it's not random with respect to time. So that's regularity. So an example of something that's not regular, um, well, so for instance, take, uh, well, in, we are, we're in Switzerland, so this is not a great example because they're also good clocks, but take, you're at a bus stop and you're waiting for a bus. In, in a city like Zurich, this is also a very regular clock because you can be guaranteed that they come at particular times. But in other cities in the world, there is quite a big fluctuation between when a bus is supposed to arrive and when it actually arrives. So that would be, yeah, regularity. So in fact, um, the tutorial, one of the tutorial questions will deal with precision, which is a way to study regularity. You look at the the fluctuation versus how long something takes. So how long something takes versus the fluctuation in how long it takes. Yeah. OK, so, um, right. so the next step now is to take the ideal Hamiltonian of a clock. And the ideal Hamiltonian of a clock is very simple. It's just h is equal to p. Or actually, let me put a. V naught. Sometimes I will use V naught equals to one. Sometimes I will uh, keep V naught 
there. OK, so this is a Hamiltonian that's just proportional to momentum. So you can contrast with this, this Hamiltonian with, for example, h is equal to p squared over 2m. That is the usual Hamiltonian of a free particle. Um, and instantly, I can tell you this Hamiltonian is unphysical. The reason it's unphysical is because unlike h is equal to p squared by 2m, which is guaranteed to, to be positive and whose minimum value, well, you could say its minimum value is 0, although you know that by the uncertainty principle, you're never going to get actually 0. In this case here, h is equal to p. This has no bound below, because momentum goes from minus infinity to infinity. And so this is something that's not bounded from below, which is unphysical, because you always have a, a ground state or a minimum energy state for a quantum system. But it is a good mathematical thing to look at. Why does it look like the ideal clock? Let me look at the rate of change of measuring or seeing the observable x on any system that is described by this Hamiltonian. Well, we know what this is. This is i h comma x. Okay. Ah, or minus i, minus i h comma x. Maybe we know it is i. No, this is i h comma x. Sorry. Um, and then. So, OK, so if h is the momentum, then we know what this is. This is the commutator of p with x, which is minus i h bar. But I'm working in units, sacrilegious units, where all, all of the h bars have been set to 1. And so this is just going to give me v0. Okay. So the rate of change of the velocity is just a constant. Again, let me contrast it to the case of p squared over 2m. Here, if we have dx by dt, which is i times p squared over 2m comma x. This is going to give us, as expected, p over m. Right. But p over, p over m is an observable. It's a variable. It's something that has many values, whereas v0 is just a constant. So the first thing we see is that dx by dt is just a constant. What this means, in effect, is that if I have, um, imagine that I started with some psi of x comma 0. So I'm going to use the notation psi of x comma t. And this is now t is equal to 0. So let's say t is equal to 0. And it's, you know, I can psi. I can write it as some wave packet like this. Then at a time t is equal to t. So this is now at time t is equal to 0. What I'm going to get at time t is equal to t, is this the same wave packet, but just shifted? So another way of saying this is that psi of x comma t is equal to psi of x minus t comma 0. Right? So if you, if you were to actually solve Schrodinger's equation for psi of x comma t, you will get that it's exactly the same as the shifted wave function from before. Okay? So it moves regularly. The nice thing about this wave function as well, or oh sorry, about this Hamiltonian is that I can now add a term to it. Let me add a v of x. So this is a potential that just depends on x. So this is very much like your standard Schrodinger equation in the case of a, a particle in a box um, or a hydrogen atom, et cetera. And then I ask, well, how does the velocity change? The velocity remains the same the speed rather remains the same, or the rate of change of x ob observable, because v of x commutes with x. So the Hamiltonian still, the only thing that uh, goes into the commutator is still p, because x does not change it. So it does not change the speed of the distribution at, at all. However, you might ask, well, what does change because of v existing there? And the answer is, there are two things about psi. So this, this equation that I wrote down works when you only have the momentum. What does work when you still when you have the uh, potential as well is that the modulus still is the same. So the shape of the wave function still shifts just as it is. But what can change is the phase. Okay. And so now I'm going to write down a claim and then prove it of what the change in this in this state is going to be.
Right. And I'm going to solve it for I'm going to solve it for v naught equals to one. Um, and what the claim is that psi shifts and integrates, so well, let's put it this way, and gains a phase by integrating over V. Okay. Which is to say the following. So I can write psi of x comma t is equal to psi of x comma zero. Oh sorry, x minus t comma zero. X t comma zero times e to the minus i integral x minus t to x v of y dy. So this is my ansatz. And you see what is happening. The modulus is just shifting. And in addition, we are gaining a phase. So remember, this, this is to say that we've come from the position x minus t to x. And exactly between those two positions, we've integrated over the, over the potential. OK. And so proving this is rather straightforward. So now we just plug it into our i h bar, the, the Schrodinger equation. So let's look at i with respect psi x comma t. So I'm doing the right-hand side, of course. And this is going to be, you differentiate this first. So I go t, sorry, i of psi x minus t 0 times e to the minus i. I'm just going to call this whole thing lambda when I don't need the full form of it. So i lambda. And then I have plus i psi x minus t 0. And then we differentiate this with respect to t. So we're going to get minus i. And the differential of this integral, so whenever you have an integral whose um, boundaries depend on the variable you're integrating with, you simply get the value of that at that boundary. And so because it's the lower one, we're going to get v of x minus t. And then, of course, it's an exponential. So whenever you differentiate the exponential, you still get that. All right, so this we can simplify, or rather not simplify, but we can see that because psi depends on the variable x minus t, we can also write this as minus i dou by dou x of psi of x minus t comma 0 e to the minus i lambda. Um, and this is, yeah, plus psi of x minus t 0 v of x minus t e to the minus i lambda. OK, that's that. Now I do the other terms, minus i, the differential with respect to x of psi of x minus t is going to be very similar. I'm just going to get minus i 2x psi x minus t 0 whoop, e to the minus i lambda. And then this differential, so minus i psi x minus t 0 times minus i. And now the differential of this, both of the things depend on x. So it's going to be v of x minus v of x minus t. And then we get e to the minus i lambda that again. OK. So everything is correct. Minus i minus i minus i. Yes, which is minus 1 plus 1. Very good. And finally, I have, well, just v times v times psi of x comma t, or v of x psi of x comma t is equal to just psi of x minus t comma 0 v of x e to the minus i lambda. And I will leave it to you to show that now this is equal to this plus that. So we have minus i 
rate of change of that is equal to minus i with respect to x, psi of x comma t, sorry, not minus i, this one is just i, plus v of x, psi of x comma t. And this, of course, the reason I want this one is because this is exactly the momentum operator, which is the part of the Hamiltonian. So I've shown that this satisfies Schrodinger's equation for the equation of the clock that I've, for this Hamiltonian that I've picked. Okay, why did we go through all of that about um, the potential and integrating a phase? Why is that useful to us? The reason it's useful is because we really need exactly something like this when we want to do a unitary operation. Because what we said when a unitary operation is e to the minus i h int times t, what you can look at the unitary operation as being is just the integral over a phase Hamiltonian somehow. So the h int sort of occupies the sort of role of a phase generator on the system. And so now I have a clock which is able to move regularly as well as pick up a phase. And, and the nice thing is that I can generate the phase in an arbitrary manner without affecting the motion of the clock. So all that I do now to make this do a unitary on a system is the following. So I, I start with the assumption that h of the system is 0. And so then I have h of the clock and the system, I just take it to be h of the clock, which is, well, let's write it out. So p, so v naught p of the clock, tensor identity on a system, plus, and here's the trick, we get v of x of the clock, tensored h int of the system. So I have the clock as usual, and all I do now is that the potential of this phase generating potential of the clock is tensored with the interaction Hamiltonian on the system. And the result of that is going to be that everything that we did here is going to repeat, but everywhere you had v of y, you're going to actually have v of y tensor h int acting on the system. And so the end result of it is going to be that you are going to act with h int on the on the system that you have sort of coupled to the clock. Now, one very important thing about this, this Hamiltonian is, OK, you see that as I shift the potential, I'm going to keep integrating over, over the phase v of x. So v, I'm going to integrate over the potential, and I'm going to keep getting a phase. So now what happens if I start with the following? So this is x. And the first thing I'm going to say is let v of x be just this, just a pulse like that. So this is v of x. Okay, There's some x initial and some x final. And I'm going to use the clock as being in some state like this. At, this is at some t initial. And I'm going to wait for it to evolve all the way. So it's going to move to the right. And even if it looks different, it's still the same. I'm not able to draw identical wave functions at will, but it is actually the same. So, oh, sorry. Yes, so take the following scenario now. I take V to be a pulse. The, main, the most important part about this is that what I've done is I've taken V to have finite support. So there's a potential that has finite support somewhere. I have a wave function that also has finite support, and it's entirely to the left of the potential. And then, of course, I know from solving the interaction that it's just going to move across, and it's going to integrate over this phase. Now, as it's moving across, different parts of the wave function will have integrated different parts of the phase. But the point is that from the left to the right, the entire wave function will have integrated the entire phase. So whatever I have here, if this is my psi of x, comma t is equal to so ti, what I'm going to get at the end is psi of x minus ti, comma 0, integral of e to the minus i. And now, of course, I can write this whole thing as x minus ti to t, uh, so x minus ti to x 
as usual, but I, I already have the assumption that I've started completely left and I've gone to the end completely right. So this is now just going to be the entire integral. It's just the integral over v of x, or v of x is a number, dx. And this is the complete integral, which is just a constant phase. So even though as the clock was moving through the potential, it looks like it's getting a phase that very much depends on which part of the clock has moved through which part of the potential, by the end of it, the entire clock state has just gotten one constant phase. And so the result of doing the clock, coupling the clock to the system, and this is something that you will prove in a similar manner to the, the proof for just the clock, but you'll prove this in the tutorial, is that this whole thing now acquires tensor product with h int on s. So you essentially get that the state of the clock tensored with psi of the system goes to the state of the clock shifted with this constant phase. But now you see this constant phase, is when it was just a clock, it was just a global phase on the clock. But when it's a clock and the system, it's actually e to the minus. We can call this, well, effectively our g, or we can call it an effective t. And it's now e to the minus g, which is some constant, times the interaction Hamiltonian. So this, in fact, is not, in, indeed, it's not a tensor product anymore in that case. So again, this is something you would prove in a, properly during the tutorial. But the way to understand it is we have a clock. We know it can move regularly while gaining a phase by a potential that we can decide as we like. And so what we do is we couple this phase generation to an interaction Hamiltonian on a system. And the result is that at the end, when the clock has passed through the phase, it will have implemented the in interaction Hamiltonian and thus the unitary on the system. Yes? Yes. So the domain of v from x initial to x final. Yeah. So yeah. So actually, I could I could write this as yeah. Let me write it as x initial x final. Neat. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? No. Okay. All right. I have a few minutes left. Um. OK, so in the couple of minutes I have left, then let me now talk about the intricacies in H system. OK, so I started with H system being 0 because this is nice. We just don't have to worry about what the system on Hamiltonian is doing while things are going on. So H system equals to 0 is trivial. The next easiest case is where H system, so, it's, so the first one is, so HS is equal to 0. That we have done. This is quite trivial because we just have to do the unitary that we want. The next thing is where H system commutes with the unitary that we want to do. Okay? Because if H system commutes with the unitary we want to do, then we know that we can, we can write this as US equals E to the minus I H int times, let's say, G now. And we will have that hs, comma, h int also is 0. So if I have a unitary operation that commutes with a, with a particular Hamiltonian, I can always find a um, generating Hamiltonian for the unitary that also commutes with the Hamiltonian. OK, and so let me, uh, in fact, return to the example of spin particles. But now I have something slightly more tricky. I'm going to take the following. So I'm going to take my Hamiltonian of my system. My system is now a cutrit. And my Hamiltonian of the system is 0, 1, 1. Okay. So in Dirac notation, projectors on 1 and 2. Okay. And now I want my unitary operation to be the following, I just want to flip the states 1 and 2. Okay. This is a unitary operation that commutes from the Hamiltonian. You see the only non-trivial effect it has is in the subspace 1 and 2, which is, which is a degenerate subspace. So we are fine. Um, a very easy way to make this Hamiltonian happen 
is by choosing an interaction that rotates in the one and two. So for example, one such thing is just this operator. So it's a sigma x in that. So let's say the, the unitary is equal to 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And the etch int is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. OK? OK, so now let me revisit everything that we've talked about and say, well, what's going to happen now? So imagine I do the same thing. I couple my clock to the Hamiltonian, but now I'm going to have plus h of s, and we're going to evolve according to this joint Hamiltonian. So what happens when we have um, a Hamiltonian of this form? Well, an easy way to see it is imagine that I do it for infinitesimal time or sorry, actually, so let, let me take the following example. Imagine now that my clock starts in the following state. And I've drawn it pictographically first. So I still have my, um, my potential v of x. But the state of the clock at the beginning is the following. It's a double delta. Okay, And I'm going to evolve it into the corresponding double delta at the end. So, so the same way as before, I'm going to wait for it to pass through the phase entirely. But the point is, look what happens to each of the parts of the, of the wave function. The right part, so we call this right and left, it has some, let's say, x. So let's say L1 to get through. Then, of course, it has this, the width of uh, the v, let's call this delta. And then uh, let's uh, L2 to get through. Whereas the other part of the wave function has a different amount. It has, let's call this L3. Then it has delta. And then it has L4. And of course, they're not entirely independent. L1 plus L2 is equal to L3 plus L4 because of that. So now I can use the linearity of the Schrodinger equation to say, well, if I have a superposition of these two states and I want to find the final state of the clock and system, then I can just do the Schrodinger evolution on each of the superposition and then add them together. right? So if I have a delta function that starts here, I know what's going to happen. So for the right evolution, so the right part of the evolution, for a while, until, until you go through L1, the clock is going to act without any interaction. So it's just going to be the Hamiltonian of the clock and the Hamiltonian of the system acting just independently. So what I want to look at is really what happens to the system as a result of all of this. Okay? And so for L1, I'm going to have nothing. So I'm going to start with, and I start from the right, e to the minus i L1 times hs of the system. I'm only looking at the system now. Then for the time period delta, we really have both of them happening together, which is e to the minus i delta h system plus g times h int. The g is the height of this. So v of x is, yeah, OK. So yeah, indeed, I'll just leave g there. I could absorb g into delta, but it doesn't matter. And then finally, for the final time period L2, I will have e to the minus i L2 times HS. Okay. What happens for the left wave function? Well, I have e to the minus i L3 HS. Then the same e to the minus i delta HS plus G H int. And e to the minus i L4 HS. Okay. Now, very important point is that, so already the reason I could just add HS plus G H int is because I'm taking the assumption that I have a pulse, and so h int is just a constant throughout. Because otherwise, I would have to do something more tricky when they do not compute. But they do, so this is fine at the moment. OK, so now the nice thing about these two things is that, well, I can look at them and I can say, well, because hs and g h int commute, all of these terms I can just put in the same exponential. I can take them in and out as I like. Right. 
it's just too far to finish. Um, and so I can just take this all out and just get e to the minus i L2 plus delta plus L1 um, hs, e to the minus i g h int. And the same thing on this side. Oh, that's me. Sorry. I thought it was the gong, but it was my own alarm. So, and this one is e to the minus L3 plus delta plus L4 hs, e to the minus i g h int. And of course, I've chosen e to the minus i g h int to be the unitary by construction. And these two things now, they're really the same. So this is e to the minus i delta plus L1 plus L2 hs u, e to the minus i delta plus L1 plus L2 hs u, because L3 plus L4 is equal to, is equal to uh, L1 plus L2. So you see, it, it didn't matter that I had two parts of the wave function, each of which went through with different time periods before it hit the potential, as it goes to the potential, after it leaves the potential. It doesn't matter because at the end, since all of the interactions that are happening with the system, all by all, I mean, they're just two. One is the system's own Hamiltonian, and the other is the interaction Hamiltonian. Since they commute, all of these operators then can be shifted about in the time ordering as we like, and therefore the entirety of the thing works. So this is the, so the end result of that is when when the unitary commutes with the Hamiltonian of the system, we are still fine. We can have a, a, wide, a wide clock uh, state, and it will still work. When the system does not commute with the Hamiltonian, then we have something tricky to consider. But I think perhaps this would be, um, yeah, so this would be a good time maybe to take a break. And we can continue then at like five minutes past. Um, uh, 10 30, so 10 35, we can continue. It's an eight minute break. Right. Anybody has questions before that? Yes? I'm missing a delta in the exponential. Oh, yeah, delta G. Yeah, indeed. Yes. Indeed. Thank you. Check, check. All right. So, close note, close note. Very good. So, let's get back. Um, right, thanks for the questions during the break. Or should I continue with? OK, so I continue with um, the third option. I think I will need a new board. I'll send that up. OK, maybe I should have done this. So. The final option is when the unitary that we're seeking to do does not actually commute with our Hamiltonian. And so I will still use the same example of the cutrit that I put up before. And now, instead of swapping between 1 and 2, which is what we did the last time, I will say, imagine that we have the same cutrit, but I want to swap between 0 and 1. So us is 0, 1, plus 1, 0, plus nothing happening to 2. OK? Um, right. OK, so now, if I was to go the same way and say, oh, I have this, un uh, this unitary, so all I have to do is to find the Hamiltonian that generates it. So for example, a Hamiltonian that would generate it would be just the 0, 1, plus 1. 1, 0 uh, Hamiltonian, which is the following matrix, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And let's, let's put a g outside it so that we have some freedom. There's some g times that. Now the problem is that my h0 plus h int is given by this matrix. So it is g, g, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0. Right? I just added them together. Now, I didn't write this down explicitly, but when I wrote h int there, and I said it's uh, 0, 1, um, this is a swap generator between the first and the second cuted state, I could have written the sum of h int and h system, right? And I would have gotten something that has basically a four ones in the, in the bottom right corner. 
And the important part about that is that is also a generator of the swap. So if you evolve that with respect to time, you'd also get the generator of the swap. And this is somehow related to the fact, it's exactly related to the fact that edge system and edge int commute. So the fact that edge system is acting at the same time as edge int does not actually interfere with its own, um, with its own uh, effect. But this is not the case here. So if I evolve this Hamiltonian for a certain time, I am not going to get that the result is just going to be swapping 0 and 1, because this matrix here in, in the middle is not actually good for me. It's going to do some other rotation. Um, I mean, another way of looking at it is the following. I've chosen H int to be the x operator in the, in the 0, 1 subspace. Oh, let's say, let's not do x because of that. So sigma x in the 0, 1 subspace. But my H naught, my H naught is equal to, well, it's 0 and 1, so it's something like identity minus sigma z, also in the 0, 1 subspace. So now when I add these two together, I'm going to get something that has sigma x and sigma x plus sigma z. So this is clearly not, this is not going to be a rotation in z. The reason I chose h in to be sigma x is because I wanted to rotate the, the, the z state, so the plus z state, to the minus z state. But for this to happen, I need a Hamiltonian that is not in z. It has to be in, in the x, y plane. But clearly now the, the system's own Hamiltonian is in the z plane. So the result of adding these two things together is going to be something that's in the xz plane, which clearly is not the rotation I want. It's going to rotate. Um, it's, let me draw it figuratively. If this is z, this is x, then I'm going to get a Hamiltonian that's somewhere over here, the edge total. And what is this going to do? Well, let's put it somewhere more interesting. Let's put it there, edge total. This is going to precess the state around this axis. So z will not go to minus z, which is where we want to go. We want to go all the way to minus z. It will just go to a something in between and come back. It's going to precess the state around that. So clearly, this doesn't work anymore. I can't just pick the interaction Hamilton in just looking at the system unitary. So then the solution would be, well, I can take u of system. And I say what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it as exponent e to the minus h naught plus h int times g. I'm just going to choose my g. So what I can choose g to be is exactly the, the width, basically the width of that pulse. Because what I know with my clock that I can do is I can have my clock basically turn on an interaction for some amount and turn it off. So during the point that it's in that pulse, I will have that my interaction, my total Hamilton in the system is effectively h naught plus h int. Oh, sorry, the g is. So okay, uh, sorry. No, it is. It is g. <laughs> g is the length of time that it takes into that. So h naught also gets multiplied by g. And now I know what h naught is, and I know what u is. So I solve for h int, right? So rather than just taking h int to be the generator of just u, I know that my u has to be generated by the sum of the systems on Hamiltonian and the interaction Hamiltonian. So now I take. Um, I just I know what my unitary that I want is. I know what the system Hamiltonian is. I pick g according to my clock, and then I just solve for h int by just taking the log. Yeah. Uh, yes. In the same, yeah, indeed. I, I I can call this a. Oh, let's okay. Actually, let me use the same thing. I'll call it delta because that's what it is actually. I'm going to call it delta to be to be that. Yeah. Sorry, when, when, I, when I'm discussing constants that don't matter other than the fact that they're just constants, I tend to use the same letter sometimes. I apologize. Yeah. But yeah, delta is essentially, let me write this explicitly, time in clock potential. So the time the clock takes to, to go through its potential. Okay. So this does give me part of the solution, because it tells me now, if I solve for h int like this, then I know that at least as a clock, as a delta function of the clock is going through the potential, what it will end up doing is it will end up doing this unitary. So if I start in the state one, then it will end up just flipping into the state zero as a result of this. However, I should still make sure that I don't run into the problem here. Because now what I've done there is I've, I have ensured that in, this, in these two terms, 
So imagine now I did the same analysis again, right? I have a clock that starts in left plus right, goes to this potential, and then this, I, I can again use the linearity of the Schrodinger equation to solve one term and solve the other term separately. I will again get these things, and okay, so this time it will not be, I will not keep the G inside here, apologize. So this is a new analysis now. So I have those two terms acting on the left and the right. But now here, I can have a problem because of the following. H int no longer commutes with HS. So it's going to be H int is going to be some solution to that. It's not, it's not necessarily, well, it's almost surely not going to be commuting with HS because I needed H int to do something that, an action that did not commute with the system's own natural Hamiltonian. So I cannot pull these through the way I liked in, um, in the previous example. And so this is actually a problem. And the only way to solve it is, in fact, to ensure that the state of the clock that you have is actually very thin. So we see with, with, com with non-commuting Hamiltonians, then, if I'm going to act with the Hamiltonian interaction Hamiltonian at the same time that the system Hamiltonian is acting, I have to have that the clock does it in a very precise manner. It cannot be that the clock starts the interaction Hamiltonian at a different times for different states of the clock, because then each of those terms will give me a different action on the system, and they will not correspond to the unity that I want to do. So the end result is that for non-commuting, HS and H int, I require so very precise clock states. Okay. There is, incidentally, another option for this, which is that imagine that I have the combination of the, the pulse and the clock state is such that it moves through the pulse very quickly, the whole clock state. So that is basically to say that my system Hamiltonian is small enough such that I can make the interaction Hamiltonian fast and uh, very large and do this very quickly, then I can approximate it again by just saying that the system Hamiltonian is zero because I did it very fast. So this is another regime in which you can work. You have, I can have a spin half particle with the, with the Hamiltonian that I've written there, but I just make sure that the unitary that I do, I implement it by having a very strong magnetic field and for a very small time. If I do this, then of course the system's own Hamiltonian is effectively zero or very small in the time that I need to act. But that is the same as saying I approximated by the first case in which HS was zero. So it's not actually a different analysis to what I've done here. Okay, are there any questions? No? All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the non-perfect nature of this clock. And how we can see this clock as an approximation of a non-ideal clock. Right, so let me keep that. Now let's take it away. OK, so the ideal nature of this clock was in two things. One is that its speed was a constant. There was no uncertainty in it. And the fact that when it hit a potential, its speed didn't change. It just continued going through the potential. Now, this is something that you can get from just a free particle Hamiltonian if you say that the particle's own momentum is actually very large. So I consider the following. Now I take h is equal to p squared over 2m. But I'm going to tell you that the state of the clock, so p c squared over 2m, so this is, the, this is all now on the clock. I'm going to tell you that the state of the clock is such that, so psi of c um, is such that, so let's say that the, the average momentum, I call this p naught. Okay. And I'm going to say that the square, the standard deviation of momentum, so the average of p squared minus p squared, which let's call this sigma p, is much less than p naught. So this is a wave packet that's actually quite precise in momentum. It has a high momentum, 
and its variance in momentum is much smaller than the value of the momentum itself. OK, then what I can do is I can expand this. I can call this PC, I can split as P0 times identity plus little p squared. This is also by 2m. So what I've done is now I've written so little p c is, is the momentum operator minus its average. Okay. All right, and then this becomes p0 squared identity operator over 2m plus p0 over m times little p c. And then I have plus p c squared over 2m. But now what I say is, well, this one is just a constant. So this is just a constant energy. So it results in a global phase, which I can ignore on the clock. This one is actually the Hamiltonian we've been considering. This is V0 times PC. It's the velocity somehow of the, of the clock times PC. And this one now I say, this is small compared to that. So V0 PC is much greater than the remainder term which means that this is now approximately the same as just V0PC. Physically speaking, it's, it's the same as V0PC because this is just a global phase, so it doesn't change the dynamics, and I ignore this small term here. Okay. So what do I get as a result of this? What I can also check, I can check two things. So I can say, what is dx by dt? So of course, again, that is i h comma x or minus i, and it's always confuse me. So h comma x, uh, I put this Hamiltonian through. This one does not give me anything. It's it's just um, it's just a constant. This one will give me v naught, of course, v naught times let's say identity operator, and then of course this one will give me my usual plus p c over m. But again, this part is now small compared to that. Okay. So I verify that I still have the approximation that my change in the position is basically given by V0. And then this is the other important part, which gives us something new. What is the change of momentum by dt? Now, this is important because I have an assumption on the starting wave package, but in order for this analysis to work, that assumption must continue to hold true. And it must be that my momentum always satisfies this condition. This is now i h comma p. Aha, sorry. What I want to do is now also imagine that I, since we know that we want to use the clock with the potential, I shall now add v of x, so, which for the rest of the approximation doesn't matter so much. It's just v of x everywhere. But now I look at the rate of change of momentum due to v of x, and I get the usual thing. This is minus um, dv by dx times h comma p. So this is almost like the oh dv, yeah, v of let's say or v of x, oh, my dx gone. So this is some operator um, that is related to the differential of the potential. Okay, so. For this, what this implies is that the change in v must be small compared to p naught, basically. Okay. Now, in in some sense, this is this is also a very semi-classical way to understand it. Is just I have a particle that's moving towards a potential, and you know that when particles hit potentials they tend to scatter. And all of this analysis is just to say that if your potential is small enough and your particle has high enough momentum compared to the potential, then it doesn't really scatter. It just goes through the potential at constant speed. And the only effect of the potential is then that the particle will have gained a phase because it has moved through this potential. And so all of this is to say that you can understand the completely unphysical Hamiltonian that we've been dealing with before as an idealized version of just a free particle with a high enough momentum not to care about what the potential that it passes through. But of course, 
if I was to repeat all of the analysis that I did with this, this Hamiltonian now, you would now say, okay, for every one of these terms that I said is small, is small, is small, I'm going to get some slight error in the analysis before. So all of this is to say then that everything that I did before all comes with a few errors when I consider a real clock, which you could actually have the Hamiltonian existing. Okay. Any questions? No. All right. So now we'll move on to what we will consider for the rest of today's lecture as well as tomorrow, uh, yeah, tomorrow's lecture, which is the Salica Wigner Perez clock. It's not called this in the literature. Um, the reason is because it really is, there's one paper by Salica and Wigner, and then there is another paper by Perez that deal with these things, so I sort of tend to refer them to as a salico wigner perez construction together. And what is this? Um, this is a clock of finite dimensions, because so far, even though I took an Id um, a non-ideal clock here with p squared by 2m, it's still an infinite dimensional clock. It has unbounded energy from above, at least, and it's a continuous variable system. So you could ask, well, can I make a clock that is finite dimensional? And this is the salico wigner perez clock construction. And um, actually, so... The, all of the, most of you, I guess, have done QIT. Uh, how many of you did the discrete Fourier transform during the QIT course? A QI, QIP slash QIT, but you, the discrete Fourier transform, you, some of you have done. Okay. How many of you have not done the discrete Fourier transform? Have you not heard of it? No one. Ah, excellent. So this will be, it should be easy to understand then. Okay. So the Hamiltonian of this clock is very simple. It's just a finite ladder. So I take, I denote the energy states by n. I start from 0. I go to d minus 1. So d is now the dimension of the clock. d is dimension of clock. OK. And I just take n, n, n. OK, so let me, let me put an omega there. OK. This, you can understand this as a truncated harmonic oscillator finite ladder, equally spaced finite ladder, whichever way. OK, so that's the Hamiltonian. And now what I do is I define these theta states, which um, sometimes we call time states. And it's really the discrete Fourier transform of the energy basis. So it's 1 over square root of d, sum n is equal to 0, d minus 1, e to the minus i, 2 pi n k over d, n. So this is a, st a set of states theta k. And they, are, they have the um, properties of an orthonormal basis. So the, each of them is normalized, and um, every one of them is orthogonal to the other. I haven't yet said what, k, what values k can take. And the answer is that, in fact, k can take any set of integer values that start somewhere and that end d minus 1 from there. So the intervals for k, you can have that k belongs to, um, let's say, the same way as n, 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 all the way to d minus 1. But you can also say k belongs to m, m plus 1, dot, 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 all the way to m plus d minus 1. And it's fine. It's consistent. And the reason is because you can see that just from the definition, theta of k plus d is the same as theta of k, it's sort of a modular arithmetic. Because if you put if you put k plus d here, then you would get e to the i two pi times an integer, which is of course just one, and so that's the same. Okay. Right. Now, why are these states um, interesting to us? The reason these states are interesting to us is because they have the property that, like the states of a clock with hour and minute hands, these states actually evolve to each other in time. What do I mean? Imagine that I, so let me take the Hamiltonian first and talk about its time period. So the time period is 2 pi by omega. What do I mean by this? If I take e to the minus i, 2 pi by omega times the Hamiltonian, then I'm going to get um, e to the minus i, um, well, 
sum e to the minus i 2 pi n omega pi omega n n, okay, which is equal to e to the minus i. And these are all now 2 pi n, where n is an integer. So that's all 1. So this is basically e to the minus, uh, sorry, what have I done? No, the i is not there. It's that. Sorry. Bah. So this is just going to be the identity operator. Okay. So when I take the time 2 pi by omega, I get back the same state, no matter what state I started in. So this, this has a time period. Now, this is actually the same as the time period of the harmonic oscillator. So one, one thing to notice is that no matter where I truncate it, the time period is always denoted by this, the spacing omega. So even for the harmonic oscillator, you would get exactly the same. OK, so now what happens if I take 2 pi by omega, but instead of doing that, I divide it by d. So I, let's say that I have, I take e to the minus i 2 pi by omega d. So it's 1 over d times the time period on the Hamiltonian. And I act it on a particular theta k. And am I going to run out of space? Possibly, but let's see. So. I can expand theta k in the n basis, um, which is nice because the Hamiltonian acts diagonally in n. So then I'm going to get 1 over square root of d, sum from n is equal to 0, d minus 1, e to the minus i 2 pi n k over d. This comes from the theta k. And then from the Hamiltonian, I'm going to get e to the minus i 2 pi by omega d times the Hamiltonian. And precise, so I'm going to be acting on the state n here. So it's the Hamiltonian eigenvalue for n, which is n times omega. n. And this now, if you simplify, you can take these together. So the omega, omega cancels out. And you will get 1 over square root of d, the sum over n, e to the minus i, 2 pi n by d, k plus 1 n. Because you see the 2 pi n over d is the same. So it's just k here and 1 here. It's k plus 1. And this is equal to theta k plus 1. OK. Let me do that. OK, so where did we get to? Yes. Right, so what I've shown there is that if I start in a theta k, then in that little time period, I go to theta k plus 1. So of course, I can continue this. If I do that time period again, I will go to theta k plus 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, so on and so forth. And so what I see is that I can really graphically or pictorially, I can imagine that the theta k, so I can call this theta 0, theta 1, theta 2, and so on. And they're sort of states on a circle, just like I have a normal clock. And if I start in any one of those states, I just evolve to the others. Now, by the linearity of the Schrodinger equation, I can also do this for a superposition. So if I have that psi is equal to sum ck theta k over k, then in a time delta t equals to 2 pi by omega d times, let's say, l, where l is some integer. This is going to go to sum over k, ck, theta of k plus l. And this just follows by the linearity. Now, the reason I put sum over k and, and not go into any detail is because you have some freedom here. So you can define it as theta k plus l mod d to ensure that you always stay in the same the same set of theta, uh, sorry, the same set of k. But as I said, k, you can also 
mathematically choose to start at any m and go to any other m. So not actually having modulus here also makes this equation correct. You just have to use the one you want, which is more convenient, which we will actually we will need and make use of that convenience later. OK, so this looks very nice. Why is it not an ideal clock? And the reason it's not an ideal clock is the following. Well, if I have an ideal clock, classical clock on a wall with an hour hand like this, what it will do is it will move continuously. So it's not just the case that at 12 o'clock it's at 12 and at 1 o'clock it's at 1, but in between, you can also see it as being somewhere in between it. That is a property that this clock does not have. Because in between, it cannot be in, in a, well, clearly it cannot be in a particular eigenstate in between. It's only in an eigenstate of, of the theta basis for these particular times. And it so happens that in between those times, not only is it is in a superposition, but in a, it is in a superposition of all of them. So it's not, it's not the case, for example, that between the time that it was at theta naught and the time it was at theta one, it's only going to be a superposition of zero and one. No, in fact, it spreads into a superposition of everything. So for intermediate times, times, so theta, let's say theta k, goes to sum over a k theta k. And one of the things that I will not, so this is something that you can do very simply. It's, it's all the, um, the evolution is quite simple because you just get a number of phases. But what you can see if you do this is that the variance of the state is of the order of d. So in other words, not only does it spread in between for intermediate times, but it also spreads to the extent that the variance becomes of the order of the dimension of the, the whole thing. Okay? So the variance is uh, d means, is another way of saying the, the error or the standard deviation is square root of d. Okay? Right. So, right. so this is why this is not a very stable state. Um, another thing that one can do Another way of saying what I've just said is to plot the variance of the state. I shall just show that to you now. A bit of time. So uh, let me do it here. So one of the things you can plot is a function of t. You can plot the average of um, average of the state, so let's plot uh, average over k. So I'm looking at which of the k's it is. Now, for an ideal clock, this should just be a, a straight line, because you should go, oh, I'm going from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, so forth, and so it's a straight line. But in fact, I do not get a straight line. What I get is, so if I, if I write the straight line as, as the ideal, so this would be the, the ideal thing that I should get, what we in fact do get is something that um, sort of fluctuates around the straight line. And, and those points are exactly those points in which it, it in fact does stay exactly in a theta. So this would be, this would correspond to theta naught, this would be theta one, theta two, theta three, and so on and so forth, but it fluctuates in between. So this would be, this is the graph of the average of k. In fact, I'm, I'm going to put, draw true graphs here. And then the other thing that I could look at is, well, what is the variance of, of the state as, it, as it's evolving? So clearly, I know that the variance of the state, again, in, in the k basis. I know that at these particular time periods, the state is precisely one, one value of k. So the variance must be 0. So at all of these time periods here, I know that this variance is 0. What happens in between, however, is that the variance fluctuates quite wildly. So it goes as. and so on and so forth. And this is of the order of d, where d is a dimension of the, of the clock. Right, so it's a nice system. Um, and just historically to say, the um, Salika and Wigner were the ones who sort of discussed this Hamiltonian as a, a nice thing for time. And Perez did a lot of analysis on, on these states and how they behave and what their properties are in, in time, for instance. Right, but clearly the state is not very stable. So how do you make a state like this stable? And the answer is the following. So they are, okay, let's put it this way. 
there are many answers to try and make the state stable, and one of the ways to do it is to look to asymptotics. So we have the sort of the uh, understanding that when d becomes larger and larger, these theta will become smaller and smaller. So this will become closer and closer to a continuous variable system. It will, of course, be a, a bounded continuous variable system where the, um, the, the position is somehow mod it's like an, a modular position. You have position on, a on an interval rather than, uh, than the full real line. But it gets closer and closer to a continuous variable system. So what we would like to do is we would like to pick a state that somehow, even though it's still in finite dimensions, is already approaching the properties that it would have if it was a continuous variable system. Okay? And one such state like that, and this is, well, let me actually write a new one here, is what we have called the quasi-ideal clock. And the quasi-ideal clock is essentially a Gaussian a Gaussian superposition of states. So what does this mean? It means that I take my psi to be, for instance, this would be an example. Let's take k is equal to um, minus d minus 1 over 2 to plus d minus 1 over 2 of e to the minus uh, k squared over sigma squared, and then e to the minus i uh, 2 pi, let's say n naught k over d of n. OK? Um, right. So let me just write down for comparison. What I'm trying to go for is maybe I put a 2 somewhere here. No, 2, 4, 4, 2, no, 4, I think. Yes, it has to be 4. So we know a Gaussian wave packet psi of x is of this form. So it's e to the minus x squared over 4 sigma squared. And then e to the minus i uh, p naught x. And then, of course, there's, there's a normalization here. So let's just write this as an a, which I should also put there as an a normalization where A is a normalization. Um, what, are the, what is the significance of sigma there? The significance of writing it in that fashion is then I know that average of x squared is sigma squared. I also know that average of p is equal to p naught. That's why I put the phase there for the wave packet. And I also have that average of p squared is 1 upon 4 sigma squared because Gaussian wave packets, they satisfy the they saturate the uncertainty principle. So when I multiply x squared and well, when I multiply the standard deviation and the standard deviation, I should get 1 over 2, or h bar over 2, if I had units of h bar. So of course, when I do it on the variance, I should get 1 over 4. And so it's a minimum uncertainty wave packet. So I'm sort of going for the same thing over here. Um, here, I've taken d minus 1 over 2. The thing is, again, here, there is some freedom in how we define things. I'm defining it symmetrically um, so that um, then it's like centered around 0. But this is, this is just a, a choice that I have. The, the main thing that you have to worry about when you make the first definitions of the Hamiltonians and, the, and the, um, the states and where the range is is just about the phases. Because depending on where what definition you do, you might have to put in phases or not take out phases that adjust it between definitions. OK. Why is the Gaussian useful? The Gaussian is useful particularly because I know that in, in position, so in x and p, psi of p is also Gaussian. So in this case, for example, it will be proportional to e to the minus p minus p naught squared uh, over 1 over 4 sigma squared. So this will be like 1 over 4 sigma squared, and then well, there's not going to be a phase with respect to x because I've chosen it to be x centered at 0. OK? OK. And, right. So the Gaussian has the property that psi of x and psi of p, if psi of x is a Gaussian, then psi of p is also a Gaussian. But this is a property of the Fourier transform because we know that we go from 
x to p y the Fourier transform. The question is what happens for the discrete Fourier transform? Because remember now that basically the definition of theta k was straight out of the discrete Fourier transform. It's the discrete Fourier transform of the, or let me put it this way. If I have a psi that's in terms of, let's call it, let's say, uh, let's do this partial calculation first. So if psi is equal to some ck theta k over k, then of course I can expand this. I put this as sum over k comma n ck e to the minus i 2 pi n k over d times n 1 over square root of d. And this I can now write as sum over n of 1 over square root of d sum over k ck e to the minus i 2 pi n k over d n. And this is the discrete Fourier transform. So to go from, I've written psi in the theta basis, to go from that to what psi would be in the n basis, I'm basically doing exactly the discrete Fourier transform. Okay? And if I did the opposite to go from n to theta, it would be the inverse, which is the same, except that I will have plus i 2 pi n k over d rather than minus. Okay. Um, right, so wait, what time have to eat to finish at? 11.20, excellent, this is good. So the reason we choose a Gaussian superposition is because the discrete Fourier transform in this sense is for high enough dimension, reasonably close to the continuous Fourier transform. So this is something that I will, I'm gonna discuss it now just intuitively and draw the diagrams for how, how this state will behave. But basically what we rely upon is that the discrete Fourier transform of this above thing of e to the minus k squared by four sigma squared dot 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 is actually approximately of the following form, e to the minus n minus n naught squared times one upon four sigma squared dot dot dot. It's not an exact thing, but it is approximately the case that when I start with a Gaussian in the theta basis, it will also be a Gaussian in the n basis, okay? So it's worthwhile looking at the extreme, extremes of the, of the um, states that I could pick. So clearly, if I was to pick an energy eigenstate, that is n, so it's, it has, it's a precise state in the energy basis, then in the theta basis, it's, it's, going to be a, it's going to be an equal superposition of all n, because a discrete Fourier transform of a, of a delta function is just going to be an equal superposition of everything. This is the same as in the continuous Fourier transform. The, disc, uh, the continuous Fourier transform for delta is just a constant wave all over space, and the same thing for the discrete. The other extreme is, of course, picking theta itself to be a delta function, so I have only one single theta, and then you see it immediately. One single theta is an equal superposition with phases, but modulo equal superposition of different ends. So what we've done here is we've gone for something in between. We've gone for something that has a variance in theta, so it's not a precise theta, and so it's going to have a variance in n as well, but we want something in the middle such that the fact that it's a Gaussian in one stays that in the other. So clearly, this is not going to be true for everything because if I take the limit sigma goes to zero, so let me now say if, if sigma goes to zero, then I just get theta naught, which is one extreme that we talked about, which is just one single theta. If I take sigma going to infinity, which is a, a, a completely broad um, broad Gaussian, so this will just become one. Then you see again, I get, uh, sorry, if sigma goes to, yes, if sigma goes to infinity, then I will get an, oh, I'm sorry, this is theta k. That's why I got confused just now, sorry. Sigma goes to zero, you get theta naught, and if sigma goes to uh, infinity, you should just get n naught, or a particular n, okay? So, yeah, I'm sorry for that. Uh, we define the, the quasi-ideal clock always in the theta basis, not the n basis. I, I messed that up at the beginning. Um, but indeed, because it has to be, this is all a function of k. And n naught is just meant to be the average uh, energy. Yeah. Yeah, so, so this state keeps generality in that sense. I know that I can get back the extreme of just a single theta or just a single energy eigenstate by varying sigma between zero and infin infinity. But what I want to do is to keep something in between. And it turns out that the intermediate case is sigma approximately square root of d. If I do that, then what I get is that sigma, let's call this, um, well, okay, the way I've written it here, 
this is actually sigma. So in the case of the discrete Fourier transform, because of Ds appearing everywhere, when I take the Fourier transform of k squared over four sigma squared, I do not get one over four sigma squared, I get something that has D. But what I get is that then the sigma in, so the variance, variance in N is of the same order as the variance in position, so the variance in K. So when we choose sigma to be of the, uh, uh, of the order of square root of D, which means choosing a variance that is of the order of D, then you see that in fact in the position and the momentum basis, they look like they have the same variance, so it's sort of symmetric in that sense. Okay, and the final thing to say is, imagine that I did the same that I did before here. I actually look at the evolution of the state. How does it look in terms of its variance? How does it look in terms of how much it goes according to this, this line in time? So let me do that. So I have T here, and I have the ideal. And the thing is, for large enough dimension, so let's, I in fact, have a plot of this for D is equal to eight, this thing remains actually very close to the line. So it also has very mild fluctuations, but for the most part, it's very close to the line. So it's much closer, for example, than, um, than the case of the theta clock, which fluctuates quite a lot. So that, that is k as a function of t, of course. So that's, that is kt. And then we ask the question, well, what about the variance? Now, unlike the case of using a single theta, here I have a non-zero variance to begin with. So I'm not going to start at zero. I'm going to start it at a particular value here. So this is the variance in sigma, or let's say variance in, in k. But the thing about the Gaussian clock is that its variance does fluctuate, but it doesn't fluctuate to the height of the previous one. So it tends to go something like that. So what we've done with this in this case is we have traded off the variance at specific times, which is what theta had. It had the property of being precise at particular times. And we've let that go. We've taken something whose variance never hits 0. But in return, we've gotten stability, because now the variance fluctuates much less. And the average value looks like it's far closer to linear. And these two statements are statements that improve with the dimension. In particular, and what we will sort of show next time, is that all of these statements, the error is sort of of the order of e to the minus d, or some constant times d. Meaning that as the dimension goes larger, this becomes something that is closer and closer to just a line. In addition, the line can be as low as I like, not zero, but lower and lower, and the average can change as close to linear as I like. And so what we will do in the next lecture is actually take the quasi-ideal state and show analytically, and this will be a proof that uses many little mathematical subcomponents to show that, in fact, the evolution of the state as a Gaussian wave packet looks very close to what would happen if you just had a continuous Gaussian wave packet and you just were shifting it over position. Because we know that in this case, it's not like that. It's, it's actually a discrete Gaussian. So each of these things, they change very complicated. But as the dimension increases, the smoothness of this ensures that it looks as if you were just shifting a continuous Gaussian wave packet. OK, are there any questions? None? Excellent. Then uh, I have a good lunch, and I see you for the last lecture tomorrow at noon. Yeah.